Jill talks about unconscious bias, which is like my big thing at the moment, and um, people keep saying, oh, well, it's not so bad, and oh, now you've done these initiatives, it's great, and it's like, no, it's got to go on and on and on. And somebody actually said to me recently when I was in Toronto uh, Film Festival doing a panel, oh, what are you doing a panel on? And I said, oh, it was gender equality. And she said, oh, yeah, it's getting a bit boring now. And I said, no, this was a woman. And I said, no, it will be boring when we're, we're at 50-50. When we don't, when it's, that's when I'll be bored. And, and there was another panel, because I do a lot of these panels, because I get twitchy if I don't do one on gender equality where there were three women on the panel and two guys, and, and actually really lovely guys. I mean, you know, nothing against them. One of them was a producer that I knew particularly well because we'd just done a film with him, and I was talking about unconscious bias. And he's saying, oh, Sally, you know, my last film, there were 80% women in key roles. And I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't... You know, it's a big audience, you don't want to embarrass him. I said, sorry, there was a male director, a male writer, three male protagonists, and you. And he was like... Yeah, but we had a female line producer, and she was really good. You know, and, and that's when you go, and you, I think I said to the audience, I think that was unconscious bias, because, I mean, yeah. you, you genuinely didn't get that. As, as you probably know, and I hope this isn't going over old ground, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, is we had the same experience uh, as Jill when the Luminar report came out, and we were actually in the middle of doing our uh, gender equality report ourselves. And it was shocking, and talk, it, it wasn't unconscious bias, but it was, un, it was just unconscious. Why didn't we know that? And we thought, God, Screen Australia, are we part of the problem? What, you know, how could this happen? Because we were surprised. And thinking about it, I'm not sure why we were, to be honest. So, uh, and then our research got finished and we looked, oh my God, it's true. And we thought, oh, are we part of the problem? And so we actually then had to do an analysis, an analysis of all the applications that we'd got. And horrifically, despite what Jill was saying, you know, roughly 50% coming out of film school are women. The, um, applications we were getting were rep representative almost, only slightly more than the statistics we're seeing, like only 60% of film and TV directed by females. So we're saying, well, we can only react to what's coming into us. Or So what can we do to make it easier, to make more people want to come in and to try and take away the bias where women encourage? So we came up with this... Um, gender matters, and it was nothing. It wasn't me or Nerida, but one of our clever people came up with the idea of of, of the brilliant careers, brilliant stories, brilliant deals, etc. So again, that was a big nod to Jill, who'd been very vocal at the time about it, and rightly so. So basically, very quickly, there were there were five prongs. Um, the first one was kind of easy, and we weighted our uh, assessment criteria. Not it was not overwhelming. It wouldn't be just if you tick all these boxes, your project's going to get money in development and it's all going to be fine. Then the bigger things were the brilliant stories where we got rid of all eligibility, um, the brilliant careers, which was uh, you know incredibly well supported. We actually got um, sort of record-breaking, nearly 500 applications, um, which was you know, difficult but worth it. And I remember we, we have an online system so you can see who's applying. And at one time we thought we might get 1,000 applications. So when the close date came, and a lot of people get so far and they go, oh, God, this is, no, I'm not for me. So when it came up and it was just less than 500, we were going, oh, my God, it's only 500. That's fantastic. It did represent about 4,000 women across it did. the board. Oh, thank just you. Saying, just saying. So, so basically out of that, I think there were 48 um, brilliant stories, so 48 new women teams. Not all new, but uh, we made sure there was a mix of new and by dropping the eligibility, we got some really extraordinary applications from people that we did know of, but were in completely different fields or had never directed or produced, but were in the arts. Um, careers, I think we had something like 117 applications and there are 13 um, that were awarded, and um, I'm actually very happy, and congratulations to Ken and his team, because this is actually the first one that's happened. So this all started to begin in January. We had to make the decisions quickly by June for financial reasons that I, I shan't really go into. So, I mean, amazingly quickly, um, Ken and his team put together a fantastic application, which embraced, we were saying, you know, not every... Careers application can be rural, but we regional, but we want to see more of a spread, and so it it was fantastic. It was well thought through, and they've carried on with that momentum, and here we are today, and it's our very first launch. So I think big yeah. clap to all that lot.
And then before Nerida goes into a bit more detail about the um, brilliant careers, because there's some opportunities for everyone here, I just want to mention the other two parts of it were Brilliant Deals, which is a scheme, which is a pilot scheme, which is trying to incentivise distributors, who, as we all know, are mainly male uh, run in this country, to look at projects by, with women teams that we will give matching monies to. And then the final thing was a female attachment, which is different from the ADGs, saying what we're basically saying is if you get more than 500,000 500, or more from Screen Australia, you must have a woman attachment. And it could be in any, you know, it's got to be a meaningful role. It could be behind the camera, in front of the camera. You know, it's all kind of above the line, or below the line. There's all kinds of possibilities. Anyway, I'm just going to hand over now to Nerida, who's got some really interesting news about some of the other um, brilliant career applications and where some of the, we're focusing on the ones that may have opportunities for all of you rather than the more state specific or more company specific. Thank you. So I get to do the list, which is the really boring part. So I'm going to skim through this, but I can see some of you have got your notepads out. And for those of you who are watching online, make notes and Google um, some of the keywords and you'll find some of the information online. So I'm going to focus just on four opportunities tonight, um, though we did fund so many, um, 13 brilliant careers. So these are just some of them. So I'm going to talk about the Australian Directors Guild. Um, we're also going to talk about the Endemol Shine opportunities, the Natalie Miller Foundation Brilliant Careers Leadership Program, and I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about the attachment program that we've got running with the production investment section. So the Australian Directors Guild has got two programs running. One of them, the Television Commercials Mentorship Program, which ties in beautifully with what Gillian was talking about. In terms of sustainable careers, women need to be in the commercial sector and be jumping between features and television and TV, tele and TV commercials. Sorry. Jub told me if you get nervous, you have to bend your knees. <laughs> so I'm about to... Bending my knees. <laughs> <laughs> So this opportunity is open at the moment. It's going to close on the 30th of November. The eligibility is basically that you have to have some directing experience. This is going to give seven emerging female directors the opportunity to go and spend time in television commercial companies, um, to be mentored, to have opportunities potentially to do some production in there as well. So that's awesome. Uh, we don't have a timing on this yet, but the Australian Directors Guild Shadow Directing Program is hugely exciting. What they've done is they've gone out to a number of production companies and got their buy-in to allow 12 emerging directors over the next two years to get credits on drama series, which is so important if you want to break into the industry, to have those credits to get the... Uh, cachet and the traction with the broadcasters moving forward. Endemol Shine with Imogen Banks and Alice Bell. What an amazing duo they are. This is also open at the moment. This is an opportunity for 12 new writers from around Australia. The budget does have travel money built into it, so it is really from around Australia. Are going to be invited into writers' rooms. And ideas from Genesis are going to be worked up to network pitch stage. Applications for that close on the 1st of December. The Natalie Miller Fellowship Careers Leadership Program is going to be a one-day conference for 100 participants. There's also going to be with that um, roundtable dinners held in each state and territory. Um, so there'll be a call out for expressions of interest for around Australia for women to put in for these mentorships. There will be dinners held with mentors um, where you'll get to know each other and little cohorts of people and little networks we're hoping will form. And then there will be ongoing mentor opportunities after that. And the last thing which I'm going to um, talk about is the attachment program, which Sally mentioned, which is involved with our production investment program. So if we invest over $500,000, we have created a fabulous problem for producers in that they need somebody to come on as an attachment. So that is above the line as a writer, producer, director attachment or below the line with the head of department. So this is an awesome problem that we have created. Sometimes we create bad problems. This is a really good problem that you guys can be the solution for. So if you package yourselves and if you look at who is getting the opportunities and who's getting the funding through the Screen Australia website or through the state websites, 
you can potentially go and offer yourself as a solution to this problem that we've created. These are paid attachments. So when they come into us and they want production investment, in the budget they have to have a line item where they have a paid attachment up to $20,000. And the way that we model it out means that there's also travel money in there potentially as well. So this is an Australia-wide opportunity. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I was at a diversity panel discussion a few weeks ago at AFTERS where it was revealed that the average person working in the screen industry in Australia is a 27-year-old white male who lives in Bondi. <laughs> I can't tell you how pleased I am to be in a room full of people from the screen industry where nobody meets that description. <laughs> So going back a year, like Screen Australia, like Jill, like ADG, we looked at the Lumina figures and thought, OK, we've got to do something about this. We announced a target of 50-50 by 2020, and it's part of an open-ended policy commitment to deliver gender equity and raise the profile of women in the screen industry in New South Wales. The stats that inspired us to introduce this speak for themselves. We're all familiar with them and the terribly low numbers of female key creatives in feature films. And of course, it's not just an issue here, as Jill's talked about. Similar figures are echoed around the world. News of our target was picked up here and around the world because we're taking action on what is an international problem. Also in November 2015, Jungle Boys, the TV production company behind Upper Middle Bogan, No Activity and Here Come the Habibs and a plethora of TVCs changed its name to Jungle. The renaming and the rebranding coincided with three initiatives. The promotion of Chloe Ricard to partner and head of film and TV production. A commitment by Jungle to employ at least one female in writing, directing or producing on every project. And the launch of a female creative talent program called Operation Sheena. Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, in, co in collaboration with Screen New South Wales. Sheena saw as partner with Jungle to co-fund a director's attachment on No Activity Season 2, and that director has now gone on to be in their slate of directors who works on their TVCs and other productions as well, and a writer's attachment on Here Come the Habibs Series 2. The Jungle and Screen New South Wales collaboration had ripples out into the very blokey advertising landscape too. Significantly, they're a leading ad agency as well as a TV production company, and the dropping of boys from their title came just days after Leah Bennett was criticised for announcing their lineup of new creative leads with, guess what? No women. Since that time, we've seen a raft of other initiatives and activities from around the country, from all the other screen agencies, establishing their own strategies to address this issue, including Screen Australia's Gender Matters that we've heard about, Gender Agenda from the SAFC, and a range of initiatives from Screen Queensland, and Film Victoria's increase of funding to the Natalie Miller Fellowship. So how has this all been received in New South Wales? Well, the first thing to say is, there's been no backlash, not any. The industry has kind of just getting on with it. They've accepted it and they're getting on with it. Our social media accounts have enjoyed huge growth via content around gender, whether it's our own initiatives or tweeting news from international and other Australian initiatives. Gender-based topics receive the greatest reach of our posts on all our social media channels. Our stakeholder base respects and responds to this advocacy work. Several screen businesses and associated organisations have also reached out to us when they want to do a project around gender in the industry. We work with partners to hold industry forums with women who have cracked the celluloid ceiling, and our recent In Conversation with Bruna Papandrea that we did in, in partnership with Screen Australia sold out in three hours. In recent weeks and months, we've stepped up our push for gender equity in the screen sector. We've implemented a requirement that all TV drama series that come into us for production finance must include female key creatives on their team in order to receive development or production finance. That can mean getting the application form in, then calling the producers and saying the money will only be forthcoming when you confirm some female directors on here. Our 2016 Emerging Filmmakers Fund is open to female directors only. And priority is also given to teams which include people from underrepresented groups. And we've had a record number of applications this year to this fund. And our new initiative for emerging filmmakers announced just two weeks ago, 
who are based in regional New South Wales in partnership with ABC Open, is only open to, to teams that include female key creatives. I think we all know what these um, panels look like. <laughs> We've also announced that Screen New South Wales will not sponsor or fund or support or attend any event or conference that includes all male lineups. We know how limited those discussions are, and we know how that messaging sets us all back. We won't support or enable that kind of sexism and exclusion. Huge opportunities are missed through discussions that exclude the perspective of more than half the population of this country. If there's one thing we've learned through all this work over the past 11 months, creating equity of opportunity for women is about giving them jobs. In this industry, it's through attachments that creatives get experience, gain credits, and step into further opportunities. We know it's not women that are the problem, and it's not up to women to solve this problem. It's not that they're not networked enough, or they're not experienced enough, or just not enough. The problem is they're not getting the jobs that they should be. So we've created some 32 paid attachments over the last few months for women, all of them quite surgical interventions into areas where the exclusion is the most dire and has been for decades. A great number of these have been triggered by women calling us and telling, that they've, telling us that they've had an opportunity on a production, but they need some support to make it happen. So we've stepped in and we've shared the cost with production companies. Some of them have been tri triggered by production companies knowing that they need to do something, but perhaps not knowing how to make it happen. Comedy writing rooms, traditionally very male, we place several female writers on shows. From stand-up comedian to stand-out writer, Frida de Guys is an emerging female comedian from Punchbowl, now working alongside Will Anderson on Gruen. And the challenge for female comedy writers, getting your joke on the whiteboard, Frida did it, tweeted it, Facebooked it, and so did Will. And of course, gender inequity is not just a screen issue, it's a social issue. Out of 190 countries in the Human Development Index, Australia ranks second in terms of overall achievement, measured by education, by health, by income, but it ranks 20th in terms of gender equality. Around the time that we were grappling with all this gender work, we took a call from the Office of Women New South Wales, who had heard about our target and wanted to know if there was a way for us to work together on creating employment opportunities for women in the trades end of the screen business, as this is the year of women in trades. Around the same time, we got a call from Kylie Washington at Matchbox Pictures. She'd been in the audience at the panel we'd hosted at SPA about the gender divide and wondered what she could do in her own patch. She returned from that panel discussion to the rap party for Real Housewives of Melbourne with the all-male camera and sound teams and got to thinking, called around all the other executive producers right around Australia for all unscripted TV series and none of them could ever remember ever employing a female camera operator or a sound recordist. So she formed the Executive Women's TV Group with other senior women from that sector, production companies and TV broadcasters to work out what they could do to change their part of the industry. <coughs> More planets lined up. Afters came on board as they do for so many of our initiatives. And together we formed a great lineup of partners all wanting to play their part. Eight women completed a course Five graduates became paid interns on all of these shows on the slides. And what's great about this program? Well, it addresses the significant gender imbalance within the screen industry sector in field of camera and sound technical roles. It provides recognized skills and a pathway to employment. It helps companies to ensure that the work environment on their productions is supportive and inclusive of women. It provides production companies with a pool of skilled and work-ready female technicians that can be engaged to work on slated projects and it supports the principles of gender equity and promotes the project partner's commitment to address it. So where to from here? Well, we're coming up to the first anniversary of the announcement of 50-50 by 2020, and to coincide with that anniversary, we're once again hosting a gender panel at Screen Forever next week in Melbourne. We're committed to raising the profile of people from all underrepresented groups, not just women. We believe that marginalized groups should not have to get in a queue behind women in order to find a voice and get jobs. This includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, people with a disability, and LGBTQI people from across New South Wales. 
Some of our new initiatives and new partners, the Screen New South Wales Annette Kellerman Award is for an Australian woman doing it her way in Hollywood. And the inaugural award was presented last month at the Australians in Film Awards to Rebel Wilson. SheDoc is a new initiative launching later this month in partnership with Documentary Australia and Road Microphones. It's a fellowship program to assist female documentary makers. We're also talking to other organisations in the industry about what they can do to help the industry make its changes, because we can't do this alone. Screenability New South Wales is a program which will deliver on an open-ended policy commitment by Screen New South Wales to work with industry to grow participation in the screen sector by Australians with disabilities. It'll include an annual film festival at Carriageworks, short filmmaking initiative to finance and deliver films for premiere at the festival and for travelling around Australia and the world and for screening online. And it will also secure long-term job placements. But the first project is for up to eight participants who will undertake bespoke training at afters with support from bus stop films and then take part in an internship program with some of the leading production companies and broadcasters on some of the most high profile shows on TV. The NRL footy show, Eurovision, Play School, Mardi Gras, with Animal Logic, with Seesaw, with Foxtel, with iView and many more. Our experience in getting these productions and companies on board has been fantastic. Over just a couple of days, we've got over 30 productions and companies on board. Everybody said yes immediately, in the full knowledge that this experience will offer a paid professional internship for participants, but will all, in all likelihood change the workplaces that they go into as well. We also have a paid attachment scheme. If you get over $100,000 from our production finance, the um, production companies have to offer a paid attachment. If you get over 200000 there are two paid attachments. We insist that they're 50-50. At least one woman will get a job out of that, and we also have sign-off on the roles. Some of these initiatives may seem like small projects. We don't have extra funding. We don't have great big um, programs to roll out, but we're changing all our fundamental and all our core programs to reflect this important issue. Little by little, all of us together, we're changing the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to say, often screen agencies are pitted against each other. And on this, you know, we're an absolutely united, supportive front. And um, I, I love hearing uh, both what Screen Australia and what Screen New South Wales do. And um, they inspire us in terms of wanting to do more. So I just want to acknowledge that up front. Storytelling is what connects us to our humanity. It's what links us to our past and provides a glimpse into our future. And there's never been a more important time, in my opinion, than now to ensure that our screens tell stories that challenge our thinking, that open our eyes, and that ignite us into collective action to make this world a better place for all of us. There's a powerful movement, again, to see gender equity, and of course, it's why we're all here today. And for me, not just as a CEO of a screen agency or as a woman, but as a mother to a five-year-old, what happens on our screen matters to me. And given that many children engage in screen content from a really early age, let us consider how women and girls are represented on screen. Now, I have some statistics from the Gina Davis Institute, and I want to share them with you. So from 2006 to 2009, not one female character was depicted in a G-rated family film in the field of medical science, as a business leader, in law or politics. In these films, 80.5% of all working characters were male and 19.5% female, which of course is in contrast to the real world. Females are almost four times as likely as males to be shown in sexy attire. And furthermore, females are nearly twice as likely to be shown with a tiny waistline. And generally, unrealistic figures on females are much more likely in those productions than on males. Males outnumber females three to one in family films. And in contrast, females comprise of just over 50% of the population uh, here and in North America. And even more staggering is the fact that this ratio, as seen in family films, is exactly the same as it was 
1946. It isn't enough to present programming to youngsters that's safe and perhaps educational. Not if there are fewer characters who are female than male, and not if those characters are less important and have less important information to share or are stereotyped. With time and repeated exposure, children begin to normalise inequality in storytelling, and then we grow up. And this goes beyond female representation. So let's talk about, really quickly, how Middle Eastern and Muslim people are presented in screen. Let's talk about how people with disabilities are invisible on television, and yet are in 18% of our population. You know, and as in a country, I hope we stand up in the next 12 months and ensure that our gay community have the right to marriage. But we don't represent them on our screen as they're represented within our population. South Sudanese Australians, Indigenous Australians, Muslim Australians report high levels of discrimination in our country. And ensuring that diversity on our screen is one of the ways that we can ensure a cohesive society. There's so much data that shows how screen content influences what we do. For example, in the year that The Hunger Games and Brave were released in 2012, the number of girls that took up archery doubled in North America. <laughs> and there was a direct correlation uh, that was researched and shown and, and proved the, the correlation between those two things. So I'm going to share with you how Queensland is going to drive more equitable outcomes for women in the screen industry in our state and our plans going forward. And it's key for us because the vast majority of writers in our country are male. So it's little wonder that they draw on their experiences, their lives, their interests when writing. And hence, our content reflects that. And it's why it's really critical that we focus on who is making and writing and developing that content. So following Screen Australia's Gender Matters announcement in November 2015, Screen Queensland launched with an event to bring Queensland's women in screen together to talk about gender matters and understand the needs of Queensland women in screen, from emerging practitioners to more uh, established practitioners. So Screen Queensland and I strongly believe that there are commercial reasons to back female stories and storytellers on screen. And as a screen agency, we have an incredibly important part to play in that process. There are a scarce number of films that are targeting women audiences, and yet there's a large volume of research and evidence that shows that women of all ages spend more time viewing television than men, and women comprise a larger share of the cinema-going audience. The MPA annual statistic on moviegoers released in March 2014 showed that the majority of people who go to movies are women, 52%, but we're seeing stories about men 85% of the time. In Gender 2016, we announced our Gender Parity Program to support the targets set through Screen Australia and to address the gender imbalance within the industry. The Screen Queensland's first year commitment to changing the playing field based on the input from the women in our industry in Queensland is as follows. So we're having a Women's Filmmaker Showcase to create an online female filmmaking showcase to really promote the work of our female writers, directors and producers. We have, it, we have a mentor and leadership program to establish mentors and a leadership program designed to, establish, uh, to pair established filmmakers with early career female screenwriters, directors and producers. We're putting creative attachments on projects and creating opportunities again for women in key creative roles. We're holding an annual incubator uh, to develop and share really the best of expertise with women. I'm going to talk a little bit further about that. And of course, we're going to undertake research and measure outcomes. So Screen Queensland held our first <coughs> event called Incubate Her um, earlier this year to a full house. We partnered with QUT and Westpac to deliver an event with incredible keynote speakers, with panels, intimate sessions, as well as pitching opportunities. We covered everything from how mentorships work to how to get a great mentor or a mentee through to delivering female-led stories to commercial broadcasters. We included some of YouTube's top female creators and YouTube themselves to talk about how to create content for their platform and, more importantly, how to monetize it. 
We included sessions on preparing your pitch um, and then getting to pitch your actual content. And we included sessions on legals, financing, and how to develop your business. And of course, one day of immersion is just a start. It doesn't finish there. So during Incubate Her, we launched uh, a monthly meetup group called Women in Screen and Entertainment, nicknamed WISE. And this group provides an informal setting for women practitioners to meet and actually build their networks. It's now met twice. We've also launched our creative attachment program and are building into our contracting with productions attachment opportunities for female practitioners. We'll be launching a specific project in 2017 that will be for women creatives and result in credits for participants. This is a major project for Screen Queensland and we've allocated seven figures for this program. We are making changes with our call-outs to ensure there are specific requirements that will enable us to increase female participation and as a result, credits. And we're measuring all of our applications and our decisions and our staff are being trained in unconscious bias. We understand our role in this process and the impact of our decisions. And finally, this is not the end. Gender and also diversity will remain part of our conscious in our decisions now and going forward and we will continue to seek new ways to ensure meaningful outcomes and continue to build on what we do. Thank you. South Australian screen women have already had a huge impact on the global screen industry. This year, it's Rose Myers, director of Girl Asleep, and there's a behind the scenes from Girls Asleep, Girl Asleep. We've had Kate Crozer produce Boys in Trees, which was in Venice and in Toronto. And that's just to name a couple from the year. But the lineup is strong for us with SA producers and alumni such as Bruna Papandrea doing amazing work globally, Helen Leake, Sophie Hyde, director of 52 Tuesdays, Kirsty Stark, Victoria Cox from Wastelander Panda. So South Australia has already had fantastic women doing great things. As we all know about Australian women, we've, we're really fantastic achieving in the face of many challenges. And so it was great to start to see information again rising to the surface regarding the issues that we face and that we're challenged by. Um, <clears throat> we decided at the SAFC to look at our in-house data and explore how we were going um, in terms of the national average. And as you can see, we're pretty much on track, not dissimilar to the national averages. Hence, it was necessary that we commit to improve the representation of the women in South Australian's green industry. In every industry, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the kind of infrastructure we have in South Australia, the kind of ongoing production opportunities that we have in South Australia are completely different to those that exist in New South Wales or Queensland or Victoria. So we are managing a whole different set of issues when we're looking at women in South Australia and how to support them to grow their careers. Um, we launched the Gender Agenda and the, a key focus is, of course, leadership and, and mentor programs. The um, first program, Placement LA, is actually in operation at the moment. So we have Gina Ashwell, um, a South Australian producer, is over at the American Film Market with Cassian Elways. Cassian is a producer who um, produced The Butler, Dallas Buyers Club, a number of other great American films. He's uh, a fantastic executive producer with extraordinary experience in the marketplace. Our decision was to reach out to Cassian and join him with a, a South Australian woman and to have her experience the American film market with Cassian. And so we think that the important thing for women um, with more established careers is that they get that opportunity to really make connections and network globally. Um, next along is Match Me, which is more for emerging women. And the, the mentorship programs there are to cover all roles and you will note, those of you at Media Resource Centre, shout out to you watching it there, that um, the application deadline for that is November 30. And the idea is that you come up with a career plan and perhaps identify a mentor or two that you would like to work with. Perhaps you have already made connection with a mentor. We'll look at your career plan. We'll look at the mentor you've either proposed or connected with already and we can support you if yours is a successful application, it's one of the successful applications, we'd support you to then 
build that program over a period of a year. To look into both um, this Match Me program, it's online under our um, development section on the website and the what's called Career Accelerator. Placement LA will be run again next year, so there'll be more news on that next year. Um, our, other, our next program coming up in the first half of next year will be Screen Sirens, which will be a workshop regarding the market. And we'll be selecting women and their projects to then work with key people from the marketplace across Australia in order to get their projects market ready. And we think that's one of the key things for South Australian women and filmmakers to ensure that their projects are well connected with the market and that they fully understand the nature of what's what's needed in the market or how to sell something the market didn't know it needed and needs to move on to know it about. Um, we also have our 50-50 target, which we're applying to all areas of professional and project development. And um, we're generally not... Uh, too bad in terms of meeting that target as it is. So we definitely want to maintain it and I don't even mind if we exceed it. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we've been on the 100% for the blokes for a while so it's not such a bad thing to, um, to have some really strong representation of women. Um, focus on directing. We'll have one dedicated directing at attachment per annum on a South Australian project with the funding by the um, South Australian Film Corporation. Um, so those are just some of the programs and we're continuing to think through what's needed to look at the kind of crew roles because I think filmmakers come through so many different roles. It's not just about writers and directors and producers, um, but we certainly want to look at um, all roles and to ensure that women will improve their opportunities for careers in the screen industry. I was happy to hear Grania mention the, um, the report that the... AFTRS is focused on in their inclusive pathways work that they've been doing. It's actually based on a PwC um, 2016 Media Outlook report, which is really worth looking up because I was quite surprised to see some of the um, reporting there. They actually say a lack of diversity in Australia's media and entertainment sector is dragging the industry's growth down. So to, to finally have it recognised that if you do not draw from the diversity that is the Australian population, your industry will lag behind and will wallow in its stasis. The notion, as Grania pointed out, that the 27 white and male um, was turned into male, pale and stale. Um, <laughs> so um, not to say that... Um, <laughs> So, so the thing is about getting it diversified and getting some richness into the system. Um, I mean, another stat that came out of that same report is that 75% of on-air talent on radio across Australia is 35-plus white male. So when you're thinking about your day-to-day, -day, what's running through your ears about what's going on if you're radio listeners, it's just interesting how um, that statistic suggests that what, what are the voices, where are the platforms for people to talk about what's going on in society and we really need to look at it across the whole media as to how we can diversify the media. I also think it's an amazing time to be here today, the 8th of November. It's not the 8th of November in America but it soon will be. And this has been one of the most extraordinary election campaigns that I think all of us have ever seen. And I think it's played out for us what many of our experiences have been over the years in trying to develop and build our careers. And we've seen many negatives to that campaign, but the misogyny has been one of the most extreme aspects of it. And um, to see such competence set up in the way it has had to deal with so much criticism. It's been such an amazing thing and, and quite exhausting, I think, for us all observing it and, and watching it minute by minute. So it's, it's, it will be really interesting tomorrow and I hope we're on the cusp of extraordinary change. Thank you. So I thought I'd start by uh, finding out if there are any questions from the audience for any of our panel members about their incredible funding initiatives. Hello everyone, um, my name's Emily, I'm a uni student at SEU. Oh, sorry. Um, I heard in one of them, I think it may have been yours, um, about the funding for online creatives uh, on YouTube. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, 
So we um, partnered with YouTube um, to look at how we could build careers um, in partnership with YouTube. We're quite passionate at Screen Queensland um, about storytelling across all of um, all different types of screens. So with YouTube, the way that we worked was um, we've run a number of sessions, creator sessions, bringing the best creators um, together with people in the state to really learn from them about how they've um, created their channel and built their subscribers and so on. Um, but we also um, have had an initiative where our screen practice or our creators could create content um, and pitch it essentially to um, existing creators from the state who, are, who have um, bigger audiences. So just as an example, um, you know, we have um, some, a, like a whole range of stuff, from stuff that's more narrative driven to stuff that's kids kids cooking in their kitchen and so on, and it was about creating new pieces of content where there was a ready-made audience integrating the characters from those existing YouTube channels, so an essentially enabling a new creator to have access into through these already existing, I guess, YouTube stars. Um, so that's the first thing that we've done in terms of um, working with YouTube um, and fully funding um, some of those to actually go into series. Um, we've also worked with um, YouTube on, I guess, es essentially sort of the masterclass of how to build your content. And in fact, what we did um, with Incubator was really walk through all of the things you need to do to actually have a successful um, YouTube channel um, and drive people to your, um, I guess, your content. Thanks very much for that. We have another question, I think, there was just here in the few rows ahead. Yes. Hi. Oh, yes. Hi. Thank you. I've just been really amazed at how quickly these programs have come about. So I firstly wanted to say thank you and congratulations, but what enabled this policy change to happen so quickly? You know, you only were talking about getting these stats last year and suddenly these extraordinary programs are here. Sally, that's probably a Screen Australia question since you were the first. Um, oh, sleep sleep them. Sleepless night. <laughs> 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 I, th I think it was basically shock. It was one of the motivators because I think we'd all been a guilty of being a little bit ignorant of how bad... We, and we knew it wasn't equal, but I don't think we'd realised how bad it was. Um, and so we just said, right, we've just got to do something else. And I think mo more importantly, we've got to keep on doing it because it's not enough to say, well, we've done our initiatives and here's your money, off you go. And I think we've got to keep going, keep going and support people. You know, the money may run out, but still support in other ways and, and keep talking about it. But the data too was really revealing. I think when you, when you did that sort of um, process of looking at the numbers and then sharing that, it actually really instigated us all into... All a bit I shocked. Think, yeah, I think, yeah, and it, it made... I know us as a screen agency, we certainly went and looked at our numbers. And again, both mm. in terms of what are we funding, but also what are the applications coming mm. in. And then you know what happens? Like if you're looking at who is in the film schools in your area, and for us, for us as a state, we have, you know, and I assume the other states too, have a lot of... Um, universities and um, technical colleges and what have you that are doing, you know, screen courses or film courses and, um, and they're going in pretty equal, um, but things are changing as they're going through those courses, coming out of those courses and then certainly in terms of um, applying for funding. And so there's a lot of things to unlock there and I don't know that we'll get them all in the first 12 months. I think it's going to be a longer process than that, but I think you know, the, the data that Screen Australia did really sort of drove, I think, all of us to make um, change and, and make it happen fast. And can I also add with that um, sheer fear and passion <laughs> and lots of sleepless nights. So when you're told from on high, get something done, do it now. And if you've got Gillian Armstrong sitting across <laughs> a desk from you saying, what are you doing? Um, you get it done, you get it done really quickly. It took us seven months to do what we did. And I'm incredibly proud. You know, yeah. I'm, in proud of, I'm proud of everybody, but I'm incredibly proud of the team that did at Screen Australia for what we pulled off. And it's going to keep going, Julian. This is just the start. Um, sorry, can I just add something? Just for us as well, it was we saw the figures come out. Um, we were inspired also by ADG and Kingston and the um, group that Jill was in as well. And asking, so what are you going to do about it? And how do you say nothing? 
you know, we're a group of a lot of strong women in our agency, and we all have opinions, and we all, and you, you can't say no. It's, you know, to um, paraphrase Justin Trudeau, it's 2016, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. You know, really, what are you going to do about it? We also had a new CEO come in who wanted to make a strong statement on her first day in the office. So on the November the 15th, <laughs> we had worked for the three months up to that day to get our figures in order. And again, it was like all the other agencies, it was looking at who's applying to us. Let's look at that. And then how, what percentage of those people are getting approved? Is it that we're not getting applications in? Or have we got, have our assessors got unconscious bias and are we just, you know, marginalising women's voices? And it was about the applications. We weren't getting enough applications. We were getting applications with women involved, but they weren't in the key creative roles. And we don't have lots of money. We, we knew that we didn't have any additional funds to roll out new initiatives. So it's about changing a culture change for us. And it was a culture change in how we work and what we do and a massive culture change for the industry. But really, the industry has come on board with us. They've come with us. When we do this, we put the thing out about saying, TV drama, unless you've got a female in a key creative role, you're not getting money. They kind of went, oh, all right then. And kind of, you know, <laughs> just got on with it. And, and that's what's happening. It's just kind of, you know, we really believe government money comes with conditions. And that's and just the way, and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. I think it's worth, um Acknowledging or thanking Lumina and AFTRS and their research mm. department and Screen Australia's mm. research department and valuing research, a valuing evidence-based strategic thinking, which is also a big part of career planning, is using real evidence. And I think that's a really important part, that you need the evidence to embolden you to make your strategic planning. Timing, I think, is also true. I think it's true that there was Courtney, you know, Tracy and I, relatively new, able to be nimble and bring new programs into play. And I think the third aspect is this very real groundswell of change that's driven by social media, that we're beginning to see new voices speaking on media platforms. We've got Clementine Ford on Daily Life for SMH saying what she's saying every week. You know, we need more of that kind of outspoken stuff that says, I'm, I'm not really going to put up with it anymore. And I think that emboldens us all to act as well. Can I say, I think it's also, it's broader than Australia too, because mm. in many ways Gina the does. Sony hack yes. and the hacking of those emails revealed a lot of stuff in terms of pay inequity mm -hmm. um, with actors, you know, some of the biggest actors in the world where you've got an equal female and male mm. who are superstars and the pay inequity between those two roles um, was revealed in that process. And that really started a big discussion, I think, in the heart of the screen industry, which is Hollywood. Um, and, you know, and I, I think all of those things happening at once, the pushback on the red carpet with actors saying, ask better questions. Um, and I think that that momentum is something that we can't, you know, deny. Mm. And having that research and data and having this sort of, I, I guess it really is a global movement. Um, and, you know, and it's amazing that it's taken to this time for it to happen since it, you know, last happened in the 70s. How come there's been such a big gap for it to happen again and not, not anything changed in the meantime? Um, and so, yeah, I think this is bigger than Australia, but it's really good that we've embraced it. And I think now that things oh, are being called out more. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We've got just time for two more questions because we're trying to get back on track for time. So there's one up the back, but there's one lady just here with a microphone. Yeah. Sorry, I feel bad because there's only two no, questions no, left in my memory. Mine's not that important. Um, oh. I was oh. Oh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So bring it on. I, I mean, I'm a local filmmaker and uh, I was really impressed with Screen New South Wales' commitment to gender equality. And I saw flash up on the screen She Docs, and I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit sure. more about that program. Um, okay, so that's a new initiative that will launch later this month. Um, and it's with Documentary Australia Foundation, who are doing good pitch today. Um, and it's for female documentary makers for in any key creative role. It's a fellowship program, so up to four. Um, Documentary makers will be supported each year um, to do a project of their choosing. It's not for production finance. It could be for research. It could be for development. It could be to go and sit on a mountain in Nepal and consider your next move. It could be for <laughs> mentoring or training or something that you just don't have. You, you're just not able to, to fund yourself that's actually going to move your career forward. It could be to develop a social impact campaign for a piece of work that you've already done. So it would be very much customised and tailored. 
Thanks for that. We'll just have our final question at the back. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name's Susie, uh, Susie Forster, and I'm a um, producer in this area, emerging. Um, thanks heaps for all the initiatives. It is, it is incredible. It's a little bit overwhelming, actually. It's like, oh, shit, I better do something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, you mentioned, you know, several times um, unconscious bias. And um, I, my son sent me something on Facebook, or he just posted something on Facebook, and it was a, a study that a university was doing about unconscious bias. And I went into the study and I decided to pick the one on gender bias. And I was horrified to find out I'm completely gender biased towards men being scientists and doctors and um, probably directors, you know. And I, it was really shocking. Um, now, you, one of you mentioned retraining in unconscious bias, and I'd be really interested to know what that involves and how can we, you know, how can we retrain ourselves? Yes. You know? um, so we're doing some training with unconscious bias. Um, so there's a couple of things. There is some really good stuff out there already. Google um, runs a particularly good program, and a lot of that's online. Um, and the thing is, every single one of us has it um, because, you know, I think it's something like at any one time there's 400,000 different things going through your brain, but you can't consciously be aware of all of those 400,000 things, right? So from the time we were little, and this is why it's so important in terms of that content, in terms of children and what they're seeing on the screen, because really from the get-go, when you come out and people are buying you pink and blue, we're like being trained in your brain is being trained to make decisions because it, we can't process all of those consciously. So your brain unconsciously is making decisions to shorten the process for you. So Google has a really good thing. We've actually engaged an external company to come in and work with our um, team. And, um, and, and that's a process of actually looking at the decisions we make, how we're coming to those, how we come to those decisions, so that we yet can put more consciousness into how we make those decisions. There's a lot of great information out there um, online and I think really it, it, it's important for all of us to actually have a look at that because yeah, every single one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, has bias. We're, doing the, we're starting on a similar process where we're doing the um, study in the Harvard. You can do an online, Harvard does an online unconscious bias test just to be aware of it in the same way that, that you've done it so that to know what we're all kind of bringing to the table when we start talking about work or about decision making and that kind of thing as well. Thanks very much. I just, uh, I told you a small fib. We do have one uh, question from the Twitterverse, which is for Screen Australia. It's very exciting, technological. Uh, will there ever be a time where Screen Australia production funding will be legislated at Director Gender 50-50? No. I, I, I... Thank you, Twitter, for being so contentious. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. No, um, I don't think it will, because I think what we're trying to put in process is a system whereby organically we'll get to the stage where it will be 50-50. Now, in, in, you know, in an ideal world, you'd like to say, oh, well, just quotas. I know a lot of people do believe in quotas. I don't, this is not necessarily Screen Australia's point of view. I don't think it's particularly <coughs> helpful when you see the limited number of applications we get from women. If we said, look, let's make it 50-50, it's going to be 50-50. If you're not getting the applications in, if you're not getting the training in, you're not getting the confidence going throughout the, the, the female creatives, Perhaps, and I'm just saying perhaps it's a question, are we setting up women to fail? So we go, you know, that's one of the, ana the analogies I use, and it, it just reminds me of what you were saying today. Is we, we actually had a female pilot today on our plane from Sydney, and she said, oh, this is your captain. And I did go, sorry, captain? Oh, yeah, of course. And I, you have to really, every time you do that, kick yourself and say, what we, you know, that's so wrong. But I do think that the analogy is you wouldn't say, oh, God, we've hardly got any female <coughs> pilots. Um, oh, let's just take all these women because they're really interested in being a pilot. Off you go. You've got to get to the stage where they can fly the plane or everybody, they're going to crash the plane. Everybody's going to go, see, women are no good. They, you know, we, we always knew they couldn't really direct. So I, I do think, and it's, it's a slightly a personal view, and I think within the agency, maybe, Nerida, you speak to, there's, there's some different views, but I think we've, what we've got to really focus on is getting women's opportunities they are as good as men. They've got to believe that and they've got to be given the pathways to achieve that rather than just saying, here's the money. Oh, I hope it's going to be OK. Um, I don't know if that's a bit we're, of a personal view. but The undergirding of, of what we put in place was that we're after systemic change all the way through so that um, we you know, the money that's been put in, we'll continue to put money into the area. We've changed our criteria. 
we're constantly thinking about it, but we have to get systemic change because we need it to be ongoing. We need to, you know, drop the pebble in the water and it will keep rolling out until it's a tidal wave. Um, so that, that's what we're trying to do, systemic change from the bottom up, from the side. We're also in production investment. It's a constant conversation that is happening in terms of um, who's getting funding, but we have to see the applications coming in to get the 50% quota, and we're not. So we're going to take a short break now, just 20 minutes, but please thank me, uh, join me in thanking our panel for their time.